Welcome back to BE 110. Today we're going to look at some applications and limitations of the constitutive law for linear Hookean elasticity. Recall that in general the linear Hookean constitutive equation for the stress Tij as a function of the Cauchy strain components epsilon KL is Tij equals CIJKL epsilon KL where CIJKL is a components of the fourth order elasticity tensor and for a general linear stress strain relation these components would be constants. Now there's a total of 81 components of the elasticity tensor but by considering the symmetry of the stress and the strain we conclude that at most 36 of these can be different because there are really only six independent stresses and six independent strains, so that's a total of 36 independent constants. We further showed, though, that by considering an increment of the work done, or the strain energy, by the stresses in performing strain, that Tij d epsilon ij, this work increment, equals Cijkl epsilon kl d epsilon ij for a Hookean elastic solid. And integrating this, we find that the work W is equal to 1 half Cijkl epsilon Kl epsilon Ij. And since this equation would be the same if we swapped epsilon Kl here with epsilon Ij here, that means that Cijkl must equal Cl Ij. So that additional symmetry further reduces the number of independent constants to 21, which you can think of as the number of independent constants in a symmetric 6 by 6 matrix. As we saw before, the simplest case requires only two coefficients, and that's isotropy. So for an isotropic Hookean elastic solid, the constitutive equation for the stress gives that Tij is equal to lambda times epsilon kk delta ij plus 2 mu times epsilon ij, where lambda and mu are known as the Lame constants. But the Lame constants are not usually the quantities that are actually measured in real materials. Different quantities are measured, and these are called the technical constants, and we get different technical constants depending on the kind of mechanical test. The commonest and simplest mechanical test is the uniaxial tensile test, which in engineering is usually done on a standardized specimen like this that is wider at the ends to avoid stress concentrations and to uh, ensure that the specimen fails in the central portion away from the attachments. That central portion, labeled here as having length L, is called the gauge length portion of the specimen because that's where the strain gauges are mounted. So the strain is measured in this central portion and the stress is calculated by dividing the force by the area of this central portion. However, there are many other types of tests that can be done as well, including three-point bending tests, uniaxial compression, or torsional shearing tests. Another test is called the ultrasonic test, where the speed of wave propagation through the material is measured, uh, which gives an indication of the shear modulus. So in an elastic solid, the stress depends only on the strain and not on the path or previous history or rate of strain. And in a linear elastic material, the Cauchy stress components are linearly proportional to the Cauchy strain components, as we saw before. Elastic solids will return to a unique natural state when the loads are removed, and the work done during loading is stored as potential energy and released without uh, any loss in a reversible process when the loads are removed. Hookean solids have a constant elastic modulus E, whereas nonlinear, non Hookean solids, the slope of the stress strain relation is not constant and depends on the strain. So, for example, a linear Hookean elastic solid has a constant slope of its stress strain relation. A nonlinear, non Hookean solid has a nonlinear stress strain relation where the slope E tangent here changes as a function of the strain. So, some common materials that are approximated as linearly elastic and frequently isotropic are listed here with their Young's moduli and in some cases shear moduli. 
g. So you can see that there's wide varieties of values for different materials. So steel has a Young's modulus 200 gigapascal, whereas collagen, which is a component of ligaments and tendons, is only one gigapascal, and elastin, which is a component of blood vessels and other connective tissues like skin, is only 600 kilopascals. So there are a number of different technical constants that can be measured in elastic materials. One, the shear modulus, happens to be the same as one of the LMA constants, and it's equal to half of the slope of the shear stress versus the shear strain in a shear stress, shear strain experiment. So for isotropic Hooke's law, when I is not equal to J, for the shear components, Tij is just equal to 2 times mu times epsilon ij. So plotting shear stress versus shear strain, the slope would be 2 mu, or 2 g. Uh, another technical constant is the bulk modulus, which is the mean stress sigma naught divided by the volume change or dilatation delta. So the mean stress sigma naught is one-third of the trace of the stress tensor, or one-third of Tkk. So substituting that into our equation for an isotropic Hookean elastic solid, we get that sigma naught is equal to lambda times epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3 plus 2 thirds mu times epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3. That's because the trace of delta ij is 3. So collecting terms here, we would see that sigma naught is equal to lambda plus 2 thirds mu times the trace of the Cauchy strain. And the trace of the Cauchy strain is the dilatation delta, or epsilon kk. Therefore, the bulk modulus sigma naught over delta equals 3 lambda plus 2 mu divided by 3. So now we have two technical constants. One is easily obtained directly from one of the LMA constants. The other is a combination of both of them. The technical constants that are measured from the standard uniaxial test are the Young's modulus, which is the slope of the stress-strain curve, and the Poisson ratio nu, which is the negative of the ratio of the transverse to longitudinal or axial strain. So if, as you strain the material by 1%, it shrinks by 0.3%, then the Poisson ratio would be 0.3. So here we evaluate the Cauchy stress in the x1 direction and equate it to E times the Cauchy strain in the same direction for the case of an isotropic Hookean elastic solid subjected to uniaxial tension. So that would say that E times epsilon 1, 1 equals lambda times epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3 plus 2 mu times epsilon 1, 1. Now using the definition of the Poisson ratio, epsilon 2, 2 and epsilon 3, 3 are minus nu times epsilon 1, 1. So therefore we get that E times epsilon 1, 1 equals lambda times epsilon 1, 1 minus nu times epsilon 1, 1 minus nu times epsilon 1, 1 plus 2 mu times epsilon 1, 1. And collecting terms and cancelling epsilon 1, 1, we see that E is therefore equal to lambda times 1 minus 2 nu plus 2 times mu. So that's one relationship relating E and nu to lambda and mu, but we need another one. And we can get the other one by taking advantage of the fact that in the case of uniaxial tension in the x1 direction, the normal stresses in the other directions, uh, so T22 and T33, are zero. So setting T22 equals zero says that lambda times epsilon 1, 1 plus epsilon 2, 2 plus epsilon 3, 3 plus 2 mu times epsilon 2, 2 is equal to zero. And again, substituting uh, in terms of the uh, Poisson ratio, this time for E11, E11 becomes minus epsilon 22 over nu. If this material is isotropic, then epsilon 22 and epsilon 33 will be the same, so we get lambda times minus epsilon 22 over nu plus epsilon 22 plus epsilon 22 plus 2 mu times epsilon 22, and now cancelling epsilon 22, we get that lambda times 1 minus 2 nu over nu is equal to 2 times mu. And so from these two relations, we can then solve for E and nu in terms of lambda and mu to get that E is mu times 3 lambda plus 2 mu divided by lambda plus mu, and nu is equal to lambda over 2 times lambda plus mu. So this demonstrates that
a single uniaxial tension test, if we measure both the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio, is sufficient to determine the Lame constants for an isotropic Hookean elastic solid. Now, not all Hookean elastic solids are isotropic. In fact, many materials, especially biological materials, are anisotropic. This is because they have organized structures. For example, bone has an organized microstructure, uh, and there are different types of bone. For example, lamella bone has layers. Aversion bone has tubular microstructure. And trabecular bone has a spongy, fabric-like structure. So these all affect the anisotropic properties, or the directional properties, of bone. Similarly, striated muscles, like heart muscle and skeletal muscle, have fibers which are elongated muscle cells containing parallel filaments. So that means that the properties of muscle along the fiber direction are different from those across the fiber direction. So in anisotropic materials, the elastic moduli can vary with orientation. For example, they can be different in the transverse direction versus the axial direction, or in the longitudinal direction versus the circumferential direction, say in the example of a bone. So one example of an anisotropic material is an orthotropic material. Bone is often assumed to be orthotropic. In orthotropic materials, there are different properties in three mutually perpendicular directions. And so that means that instead of being one Young's modulus, there are three Young's moduli along three mutually perpendicular axes, three shear moduli in three mutually perpendicular planes, and three independent Poisson ratios that could be measured by doing three separate uh, uniaxial tension tests along the three different directions. So three uniaxial tension tests together with three uh, plane shear tests would be enough to determine all nine coefficients of an orthotropic uh, elastic solid. The structural axes of orthotropic symmetry are defi defined by the microstructure. So in the case of bone, one axis is the axis of the uh, long axis of the bone, one axis is the circumferential axis of the long bone, and the third is the radial or transverse axis of the bone. So the material properties of bone as a linearly elastic solid have been characterized by doing these tests and using nine independent material constants instead of just two. An intermediate case between orthotropy and isotropy is transverse isotropy, where the material has one preferred axis, such as a fiber axis. This might be the long axis of the bone, or the axis of uh, a muscle fiber, uh, or the axis of the collagen fibers in a connective tissue like ligaments or tendons. The difference between transverse isotropy and orthotropy is that we assume or find that the properties are about the same in the direction in the plane transverse to the fiber axis, transverse to the preferred axis. So for example, in the case of long bone, the material properties are different along the axis of the osteons, but not very different transverse to the axis of the osteons. This reduces the number of independent material constants from nine in the case of orthotropy to five, being now two Young's moduli one in the direction of the fibers and one in the transverse plane, two Poisson ratios, one measured with in uniaxial tests along the direction of the fibers and another measured in uniaxial tests transverse, and uh, one shear modulus. So here's a table of actual measured technical constants in human bone, and this is measured in different types of bone and using different techniques. Uh, and the important uh, difference here is these first two columns assume that bone is transversely isotropic, so TI here stands for transversely isotropic, whereas the second two columns allow that the bone could be orthotropic. So you see that there's a total of three Young's moduli, three shear moduli, and six Poisson ratios, of, of which three are independent in the case of orthotropy. Now, you can see that in the case of the tibia or the femur, there's a much bigger difference between E3, which refers to the direction of the long axis of the bone, so the 
Young's modulus is much greater along the long axis of either femur or tibia than the Young's moduli in either the other two directions, either the radial or circumferential directions. And compared with that difference between the radial and circumferential directions compared with the longitudinal direction, these differences are smaller. And so that's what's motivated the assumption of transverse isotropy in these experiments. So here you see that for these studies of human femur, the E1 and E2 are assumed to be the same. And so the only difference is with E3. And so bone is more accurately approximated as orthotropic, but the major differences, directional differences, are between the long axis and the other two directions. And so transversely isotropic is also a common approximation. One other difference here is the way these measurements were made. You'll notice that the results are not the same because they were made uh, using different techniques. So M here stands for machine. And so these were the results of uniaxial tensile testing on a standard machine. U stands for ultrasounds, and so these uh, measurements were obtained using ultrasound techniques. So you can see that depending on the technique that's used, different measurements in real materials can be obtained. So now what I want to do, having told you about some of the properties that uh, hooky and elastic materials do display, I want to discuss some of the properties that they do not display. So the first thing that a hooky and elastic material can't display is nonlinear properties, because hooky means linear. Uh, here is an example of a nonlinear stress-strain relation, and this type of stress-strain relation is typical of many soft biological tissues, like skin and muscle and ligaments and tendons, where the more you stretch the tissue, the more the stiffness, the Young's modulus or the tangent modulus, increases. And actually, if you plot the tangent modulus versus the stress for many soft tissues, you find that the tangent modulus is approximately proportional to the stress. Notice I said the stress, not the strain. So that means that the derivative of the stress-strain relationship is approximately proportional to the stress, or in other words, that the stress-strain relationship of many soft tissues is approximately exponential. Another type of property that linear hooky and elastic materials won't display are anelastic properties, namely those in which the stress does not depend only on the strain. So one example of uh, anelastic properties are plasticity or properties that are associated with irreversible failure. So for example, in ductile failure, an elastic limit is reached beyond which the material deforms irreversibly. So beyond this elastic limit, if we release the stress, the material will not return all the way to its original unloaded state. If we keep going, we'll ultimately reach the ultimate tensile stress and ultimate tensile strain, and we'll get ductile failure. So ductile failure occurs following yielding and can occur at a significantly higher strain than the elastic limit. If we were to unload the ductile material prior to failure, the elastic strain would be recovered, but the plastic strain would not, and there'd be some permanent lengthening or permanent set of this material. Furthermore, when we stretch it again, it's often stiffer, and this uh, property is known as strain hardening. In contrast, brittle failure occurs shortly after the elastic limit is reached, and this is occurs in uh, crystalline or brittle materials such as glass. So plasticity or anelastic behavior uh, is clearly a property that cannot be captured by an elastic constitutive law and is uh, usually associated with the loads that are in excess of the normal or desirable working loads of the material. Here's what the stress strain curve looks like for a long bone you can see that the elastic limit is reached at a strain of under 0.5%. Beyond this point, there'll be some damage or yielding of the bone material. It's hard to tell exactly from the curve where the yield point is, and so in engineering, uh, sometimes the convention of using a 0.2% offset yield is uh, used. So drawing a line parallel to the tangent of the stress-strain curve in the elastic zone, and finding where that intersects with the stress-strain curve is used as an estimate of the yield stress. So for bone, the yield stress is about 120 megapascals, 
and the yield strain is about 0.8%. In contrast, the ultimate tensile stress is about 140 megapascals, uh, which is somewhat higher than the yield stress. You can see that the ultimate tensile strain is a lot higher. It's almost twice as high, about 1.6%. Uh, the slope or the Young's modulus uh, of long bone in the longitudinal direction is about 19 gigapascals. Here are some measures of the strength of bone. So we talked about the ultimate tensile st stress and strain. The ultimate compressive stress is at 170 megapascals. The ultimate percentage contraction, so the, the negative strain of failure in compression is about 1.8%. The ultimate bending strength is 160 megapascals. And the ultimate torsional shear stress, about 54 megapascals. Another anelastic property that's exhibited by bone and other tissues is a dependence of the stress on the strain rate. So in an elastic material, the stress only depends on the strain, not the previous strain or how fast the strain is changing. But in bone, as the strain rate is increased, the stiffness increases and the strength changes. So at lower strain rates, bone is less stiff. As bone is strained more rapidly, the stiffness increases, and you can see over this range of strain rates here, the, st the stiffness, the Young's modulus of bone, actually doubled. On the other hand, you'll also see that this range of strain rates is very high. It's about six orders of magnitude. And normal, under normal working conditions, the strain rates that bone experiences don't change nearly that much. So in real physiological conditions, the effects of strain rate on bone stiffness are not very great. But this is an anelastic property that cannot be, by definition, uh, modeled by an elastic constitutive law. There are a number of other anelastic properties that are seen in soft tissues, and many of these properties are known as viscoelastic properties. So one of them is hysteresis. Hysteresis is when the load is increased, the stress-strain curve is different than when the load is decreased. So you can see this loop here, labeled 1, is called a hysteresis loop. As the load went up, the stress followed this curve, but as it went down, it followed a different curve. And the area of that loop uh, is called the hysteresis loop and represents energy dissipation during the loading and unloading process. So in other words, this was not a thermodynamically reversible process. And unlike an ideal elastic material, Real soft tissues, such as coronary artery here, exhibit some uh, energy dissipation during loading and unloading. Another anelastic property that's uh, seen in this particular example is called preconditioning, where you can see that the uh, two here represents the second loading cycle. And you can see that the second cycle is different from the first. And in fact, the hysteresis loop is a little bit smaller. And then the third is actually different from the second and the fourth is different from the third. But if you repeat it enough times, the curves become reproducible. There's still some hysteresis that's hard to see here, but you can see here two anelastic properties. One is that the stress depends not only on the strain, but whether the strain is increasing or decreasing. That's hysteresis. Another is that the stress depends on the history of previous cycles of strain. And so as you apply the same history of loading and unloading several times to uh, a soft tissue, you actually get a different stress-strain loop until the uh, experiment has been repeated enough times for the tissue to be so-called preconditioned. So these are anelastic properties. Another anelastic property is called stress relaxation. So in this experiment, the tissue was stretched and held at a fixed length for a period of 1800 seconds. And what you can see is that uh, almost immediately after the stretch, the stress decays at first fast and then more slowly. And this type of behavior is called stress relaxation. This again is not an elastic property. In an elastic material, if the strain stayed constant, the stress would be constant. But in real biological tissues, there is some anelastic behavior, and this is known as stress relaxation. Together, these properties are often called viscoelastic properties properties that reflect a combination of uh, an elastic property and a fluid viscous-like behavior. Some other examples of anelastic properties that are seen in real materials, uh, including biological materials, include viscoplasticity. 
So one example of this is whole blood. So whole blood is a fluid, but actually at very, very low loads, it actually behaves like a solid, and it actually takes a finite stress to get whole blood to start flowing, uh, and that yield stress is an example of viscoplastic behavior. Thixotropic materials are materials that undergo what are called sol gel transformation. Depending on the stresses, they can change from solid-like to fluid-like behaviors, uh, induced by shear stresses such as agitation or stirring. An example of this is the actin inside the cell cytoskeleton. If uh, cells deform, their, their cytoskeleton can actually break up and change from a solid-like property to a fluid-like property. So viscoplasticity and thixotropy are two very similar uh, anelastic properties. Another one is known as strain softening and Strain softening is also known as the Mullins effect, and it represents a progressive irreversible reduction in stiffness when a new maximum elastic load is experienced. And examples of materials that undergo this type of behavior include elastomers like rubber and tissues like the small intestine. An example of strain softening is the first time you blow up a rubber balloon, it's harder to inflate than the second time. And here we see an example of this is that the first time the material is loaded, it goes up one curve, but then when it's unloaded, it goes up a new curve. The first time it's loaded to B, it goes up this curve, but then when it's unloaded, it goes down this curve, and the second time it's loaded, it goes back up this curve, and then rejoins this curve after you exceed B. But then when you go down, it comes down a new curve. So with each successive load to loading to new higher maximum strain, the material becomes permanently softer. And this is a major contributor to the preconditioning behavior that we saw in soft tissues. So these are all examples of real material properties that cannot be described by a elastic material law. And real biological tissues all exhibit some of these properties. Nevertheless, we frequently approximate real materials, including biological tissues, as being elastic because many of these anelastic properties are, are not very significant under physiological conditions. For example, the effects of strain rate on the stiffness of biological tissues require very, very large ranges of strain rates that wouldn't normally occur in vivo. The effects of strain softening probably don't really occur in vivo um, unless we uh, perhaps hyperextend a, a joint or something. So under many conditions, these anelastic properties may not be so significant as to prevent us from using the approximation of elasticity. On the other hand, in most soft tissues, the approximation of a linear elasticity doesn't work so well because they undergo relatively large strains and therefore have nonlinear stress-strain relations. So that concludes this discussion of constitutive laws for elastic solids and the properties of uh, real uh, solid materials.